old you are and where you're from, okay? And I started recording. Um, I am Ian. My name is Ian, and I am from Pittsburgh, PA, and I'm 11 years old. Okay. Soham, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Soham. Please don't mind my bald head. <laughs> um, uh, I am uh, Shilpa's son, and I'm 13 years old, and I live in Roxbury, New Jersey. Okay. All right. We have Ishireen on. Uh, she's coming, Shilpa. Okay. Jay Baba, Jay uh, Bill. Jay Baba, Jay Baba. So we have, um, there's Meher. Okay, Tahana, what about you? Hi. Can you please turn on your video? I request all the children to turn on their videos. Okay, and we want the videos on so that Bill gets to see everyone and knows their faces and their names. Okay, thank you. Um, Shilpata, mine is just going on and off for some reason. That's okay. As long as you guys can come back on, that'll be good. I can. Okay, even momentarily is fine. So, uh, Sahana, could you turn on your video, please, and talk about yourself? And then we'll go to my hair. Okay. All right, we'll go to my hair so she can fix her stuff. Go ahead, my hair, introduce yourself. Uh, I am a fifth grader and I'm 10 years old and I like to play video games and sometimes play outside. And where are you from, my hair? Uh, I I I am I I am from India and now I'm in Connecticut. Okay, good. All right. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, who's next, Trinity? Sure. Uh, my name is Trinity, and I'm I'm sixth grade. Uh, I live in Colorado. Good. 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 All right, Sahana. Sahana, can you please introduce yourself? Hi. We need to see your face, Sahana. We see a wall, not your face. Hi. All right. So um, I don't know if other kids are coming today, Bill, uh, but this is what we have so far. Uh, once the others join, oh, Shireen's here. Shireen, you want to introduce yourself? Hmm. She's gone. Shilpa, you wanted us to introduce herself? Sorry. You wanted us to introduce ourselves? Yeah, I'm all, yeah. If you want to introduce yourself, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm Jay Sri, uh, physician from India, from Hyderabad. Ah. Shilpa's mother in law, Soham Sahana, and Ayan's grandmother. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Well, Maybe I'll introduce myself. <laughs> For those of you that don't know me, my name is Bill Cliff, and I'm a musician and storyteller. I've worked many, many times in the schools and in places like the New York State Museum telling stories. And of course, I've been singing and writing songs for Baba for probably almost 50 years. So I thought we could do like a two part program today. And, and towards the end, if you guys want to ask questions and things, you're certainly welcome. 
I want to start out with a little celebration of Earth Day, uh, Earth Day, which is next Thursday, with some songs and stories, and then we'll have maybe some Baba stories and Baba songs, okay? So I want to start <clears throat> with a legend of how the birds got their songs, but first I'm going to play a tune on my recorder here, a little tune called The Bird, and there's a story that goes with this tune. It's about a saint whose name was Mungo, and he lived in Scotland. 1500 years ago and he lived in a monastery with other brothers and it so happened that one of the brothers whose name was Surf had a pet robin and two of the other brothers accidentally killed Surf's pet robin so they figured they didn't want to get blamed so they placed the blame on Mungo on Saint Mungo and rather than get angry with them uh, Mungo just took the little bird into his hands and prayed over it and blessed it and the little robin just flew around the room. It was so happy, it was alive again. So someone wrote a piece of music called The Bird, a Scotsman named uh, William Jackson, who's a harpist. I'm just gonna play a little bit of it to introduce the story, the Native American story of how the birds got their songs. So you can imagine as I'm playing this, this represents how happy that little robin is. You can imagine the little robin flying around. <clears throat> Just have to adjust my screen here so I get the gallery view. <clears throat> well, a long, 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 long time ago, before recorded history, the Iroquois Indians tell us that there was a time when the birds had no songs. Women could sing and men could sing, and every morning the people of the Iroquois would greet the rising of the sun with a song. And as they did, all the little birds would stop whatever they were doing to listen and they'd say to themselves, oh, oh, if we can only sing, if we only had the gift of song as the Indian people do. Well, one day, it so happened that the great spirit, the creator, decided to visit his creation. And as he walked through the fields and the forest, he was well pleased with what he heard and saw. But something seemed to be missing. And he couldn't quite put his finger on it till that evening, he heard the drums beating and he heard the sacred song of farewell that the Iroquois people sing as the sun is setting beyond the distant hills. And he noticed that all the little birds were listening just as intently as he was. And that's when the great idea came to him. Of course, of course, he said, how could I have forgotten that? The birds, I have to give the birds songs. So the next day he went to the council rock and called a council of all the birds. Flocks and flocks and flocks of birds came. They perched, it seemed, on the ground for as far as the eye could see, all twittering very excitedly amongst themselves, <clears throat> till the great spirit held up his hands, and there was silence. Little ones, he said, I have called this great gathering to know if you would like to sing, if you would like to have the gift of song as my Indian people do. Each of you will be given the gift of a song, and to the ones that try and strive the hardest, I will give the sweetest songs of all. For to have things that are lovely in this world all must work very, very hard. So tell me, little ones, do you wish for song? And with one voice, all the little birds said, yes, ah. The great spirit was pleased. So be it, he said. Tomorrow morning, very early, I want you to gather very, very early in the morning near this rock. And when the sun comes up, I want you to fly. Fly as high as your wings and hearts will take you. And there for each of you, I will have a song waiting. And to the one that flies the highest, I will give the sweetest song of all. Then he disappeared. 
The next morning, such a host of birds appeared around that rock. They were perched in all the trees and in the bushes and on the boulders and on the ground, it seemed for miles around, all chattering very excitedly amongst themselves about this great gift they knew they were going to receive. All except one little brown bird, a little thrush. She did not look happy at all. She was looking at her wings and thinking, how can I, who have such tiny wings, ever hope to earn a really pretty song? And as she looked around, she noticed that just a little bit of distance away, there was the king of the birds, the eagle, the great golden eagle. He was preening himself, his chest was all puffed up, looking very proud, and his, his, his beak was facing the heavens as if he was looking off at a far off distance. And Suddenly a thought flashed in that little thrush's mind, and quick as a wink, she flew and hid in the eagle's feathers. Now at that moment, that great bird was imagining himself soaring way above the other birds. He knew he was the strongest flyer, and he was trying to imagine what that, that beautiful song was he knew he was going to earn. He didn't notice that a little passenger had snuck on board. Ah, the sun came up. And that great throng of birds rose into the air, beating their wings. It sounded like the rushing of a great wind, and higher and higher they flew, till it wasn't long before the smaller ones and weaker ones had to drop out. But each of them had been given the gift of a song, or at least a few notes, and they learned them by singing them over and over and over again. Well, as the sun set that evening, only a few birds were still up in the sky. And when it rose up the next morning, only one bird was up there, or so it thought, and that was that great golden eagle. And he was exhausted. He was huffing and puffing. His heart was pounding. He'd been flying all night. He was completely exhausted. Well, all that commotion woke up his little passenger. She flew out, saw where she was, and wonder of wonders, she flew straight up into the sky. And that's when that eagle noticed that he'd had a little passenger on board. He was furious. And he would have chased after her to teach her the lesson of her life. But he realized he had just enough strength to make it back to the earth. But that little bird, she kept flying higher and higher and higher and higher till she came to a parting in the clouds and she flew into the spirit world. And there she heard the sweetest of all the songs. And she stayed there till she learned it note by note by note by note. And she flew out the way she'd come in and saw what a great distance she had to fly back to Earth. So she started to dip and glide and make her way back and make her way back. And as she did, a thought occurred to her, well, maybe, I mean, I did kind of play a trick on the eagle. I mean, maybe I didn't really earn this song. She started to feel a little bit, just a little bit guilty and ashamed. Well, she got lower and lower and lower. And pretty soon, what did she see down below but that council rock? and gathered all around the rock were all the other birds looking up into the sky, looking for her. They knew she tricked the little eagle, the big eagle, and she knew it. She, she, they knew that she knew it as well. And right in the middle of that rock, there was that great golden eagle glaring up into the sky, just waiting to catch a first glimpse of that little bird so he could take off and teach her the lesson of her life. So what did that little bird do? She skimmed way, way, way over the tops of the trees and flew deep, 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 deep to the deepest part of the forest where no winged creature could ever see or hear her. And even to this day, that little bird, that little thrush, rarely comes out of the, the deep, deep forest. And that's why she's known as a hermit thrush. And even though she knows she kind of tricked the eagle a little bit to earn that pretty song, there comes a time where that song just pours from her heart and bursts out of her beak. And when that happens, all the creatures in the forest stop whatever they're doing to listen to the sweetest song of all. And that, from the Iroquois Indian people, is the legend of the hermit thrush and how the birds got their songs. Now, right away, we're going to go from Iroquois American Indian stories, and I'm going to go to India, and tell a tale that Lord Buddha used to tell, maybe 2,500 years ago. And he, 
Buddha to his disciples told many, many animal stories. And some of the animal stories you may have seen in some picture books like the monkey and the crocodile and other stories like that, they are actually his, I think they're called Jataka or Jataka tales. And I'm going to share one about a beautiful, magical golden deer whose name was Golden Foot. And I'm going to introduce it with a little tune. And I'll tell you the story. time ago, when the great land of India was covered with forests. Deep in one of those forests, high in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, there lived a deer whose coat was the color of pure gold. His eyes sparkled like jewels, his antlers rose above his head like a silver wreath, and his hoofs, ah, his hoofs shined so much with brilliant sunlight that he was known as Golden Foot. Now, Golden Foot was the king of all the gentle deer in the forest. And for years, he and his queen, a lovely young doe, ruled peacefully and happily till one day, a clever and crafty hunter appeared in that forest. And he hid and he watched the deer and observed them. And he saw that every morning and afternoon, they'd walk down a long, long grassy track to a stream to get a drink of water. So he set a trap. He took a long, 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 long piece of rope tied one end around a tree branch, made a noose on the other end and hid it in a clump of grass along that path. And sure enough, <clears throat> that afternoon, there was Golden Foot trotting way ahead of the other deer. And suddenly his hoof got caught in that noose and he kicked and tugged and pulled and tried to break free and tried to break free. But the more he tried to break free, the tighter that noose got till it got so tight that he cried out in pain. Now, the other deer had never, never heard their leader cry out like that before. They were terrified. They scattered. They ran away in fright. All except his queen, who was very brave. She trotted up to his side and said, Golden Foot, come on. You're stronger than you think. Now try to break out of that noose. So he kicked and tugged at the rope more and more, but it just held fast. The queen thought to herself, what are the deer going to do without their leader? He's their king. They can't live without their leader. I must do something to save his life. So she spoke to Goldenfoot and said, Goldenfoot, don't be afraid. I'm going to stay right here by your side. And when that hunter comes, I'm going to plead for your freedom. Well, it wasn't long before there was a thumping and crashing through the brush. And a fierce looking hunter with a long, scraggly black beard appeared. He had a spear in one hand, a knife in the other. And he, rode, he strode right up to the deer and raised that spear. And very quickly and bravely, the queen took a step forward and said, wait, wait, sir, please, 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 wait, wait. <clears throat> the one you have captured, he's wise beyond compare. He's the king of all the deers and deer in the forest. They can't live without him. Please, please, spare his life. Let him go. Take my life instead. The hunter couldn't believe his ears. He never heard of any human being offering to give their life for their king or their queen. But he looked back at that great golden animal, thought of all the food his family could have, and his hand tightened on that spear. Then he looked back at the queen. How brave she is, he thought. And he looked in her eyes, and he didn't see fear but kindness. And he thought he also saw forgiveness. And something started to happen in that hunter's heart. Something started to melt and melt and melt and melt. And all of a sudden, that hand, which had been gripping that spear so tightly, began to shake and quiver and shake and quiver. And suddenly, it flung open, and the spear clanked to the ground. And the hunter spoke to the queen of the deer, and he said, Today you have spoken to me so sweetly in the language of men that I grant you your life queen of the deer, and I grant freedom to the king of the deer. 
And he strode over to where Golden Foot was bound by that rope, and he took his knife out and began to cut through the noose. And as he did, Golden Foot thought to himself, ha, this hunter looks mean and fierce, but inside he has a fair and kind and noble heart. I'm going to reward him. So when he was free, Golden Foot trotted to a nearby tree, pawed at the ground, and unearthed three shining magic jewels. And he gave them to the hunter and he said, these wish-fulfilling gems will provide for you and your family for the rest of your life. So remember, never hurt any living creature again. And wherever you go, always try to help and serve others in need. And reminding the hunter to heed these words, Golden Foot and his lovely queen trotted off into the ancient Indian forest. I've got a song for you. Um, and this again, this is a song about our environment, about saving the things in our environment, the trees, the streams, the air, the world. And it was written by a park, park ranger from New Jersey named David Orleans, who's a park ranger down in the Pine Barrens, kind of a wild area in southern New Jersey. And the first half of each verse, now that you're all muted, if you want, I will sing a line and you say, it's like an echo. You sing that line right back to me. Halfway through the verse, I'll sing so many lines, you have to be quiet. Then we can all sing a chorus together. And the first chorus goes, Save some trees for me, mister. Save some trees for when we grow up. Pause, when we grow up. And that's the thing. There's always that pause before we say the when we grow up twice all right so I'll just go through the song like I said if you want to sing sing the lines back to me I'll pause after each of the first four lines and then I'll sing so many you can't uh, you can't really fit any singing in if I were a tree in the middle of the woods with the sun and the rain I'd feel real good and make some shade to cool my friends I grow seeds and buds and leaves on my branches. Let the squirrels and the birds make homes and the chances are good that I'd be happy right to the end. Save some trees for me, mister. Save some trees for when we grow up. Pause. When we grow up. I were a fish swimming in the stream and I have a lot of fun if you know what I mean say hi to a frog <clears throat> he's looking for a fly then I'd hide in the reeds from that silly old musk I'd stay away from worms on hooks cause I know that I'd rather stay here in the stream till the day I die save some streams for me Mister, save some streams for when we grow up, when we grow up. If I were a cloud floating in the sky, I'd have a lot of fun. Ah, oh, no, I'd, yeah, I'd have a lot of fun as I drift by. I'd go to the sea. Fill with rain Then I'd rain on the city and all the people in it And I'd clean all the dirt from the air in a minute The sky would be blue when the sun came out again Save some air, mister Save some air for me, mister Save some air for when we grow I were the sun, making daytime bright, looking down on our earth, spinning day and night, like a great big ball 
of blue and green where the land and the sea and the sky come together the wind and the clouds swirl around making weather it's the prettiest doggone planet that i have ever seen save some world save some world for me mister save some world for when we grow up Save some world for when we grow up, when we grow up. Jay Baba. I have one more story, and then maybe after I do one more story, one more song, before we switch to the Baba stories, maybe, maybe some of you might want to tell me something you might be doing to celebrate Earth Day, or maybe some reaction, you know, one of the stories you particularly liked, what you think about the story. But first, I want to tell a fairy tale from India. And this is one that um, I call it a fairy tale for people of all ages. Because it just has it's a very nice quality to it. Some of you may have heard it being of Indian heritage and all, but it's called the Magic Lake. And uh, it seems a long, oh, See, do I want to play a tune? Yeah, I want to play a tune to introduce it. Very quick tune on this. I always like to introduce my song, my songs, my stories with uh, tunes on the recorder. Long, long time ago, in the state of Rajasthan, the king, the Raja, was sitting with his three daughters one day. They were kind of passing the time, having a nice chit-chat. Then he got kind of a serious expression on his face, and he said, tell me, dear ones, whom would you like to marry? The oldest daughter said, well, father, I want to marry the richest prince in the kingdom. The middle daughter said, well, father, I want to marry the handsomest prince in the kingdom. Now, the youngest daughter, whose name was Purnima, I believe Purnima means moon, she didn't say a word. Come, come, said her father. Who would you like to marry, Purnima? Father, she said, I trust your judgment. I will marry whoever you choose for me. Whoever said the oldest, whoever said the middle, they were very jealous because Purnima was her father's favorite. Well, said the oldest. Father, why don't you make her marry a beggar? Yeah, said the middle daughter. Make her marry a beggar. So they started chanting. Make her marry a beggar, make her marry a beggar, make her marry a beggar. So that foolish old king, just to, just to prove his favorite daughter would be true to his word, her word to him, said, Purnima, I command you this very moment to go out the palace gate and marry the first beggar you meet. Yes, father, she said. So followed by the royal priest, she packed a few things in a bag. She went to the great golden doors of the palace and they swung open. Well, she didn't have far to look, for seated in a straw basket right at the edge of that gate, that palace door, was a scrawny little man, thin little man, whose legs and arms were all twisted and deformed. So he could just hold out one hand so some kind soul could maybe put a few coins in it or a few scraps of food. And that's how this poor soul lived from day to day. Ah, but on this day, that outstretched hand won him the hand of the lovely princess Purnima in marriage. The ceremonies were performed. Now her father had said, go off and live with him in the countryside. <clears throat> well, this poor fellow couldn't even walk. So just like a village woman puts a jug of water on her head to take back to her family after she's been to the well, Purnima had to hoist up that basket with her new husband on it, place it on her head, and go off and live in the countryside. Well, this poor fellow couldn't work. So she had to do very, very simple work. They would go from village to village and town to town, and she would do things like 
mend people's clothes, cook food, clean their houses. Maybe if the mother had to go out and help her husband on the farm, she would take care of the children. And as the days and weeks went by, her nice, pretty princess's clothes started to look pretty raggedy. But also as the days and weeks went by, she noticed there was something really, really special about this, this strange looking husband of hers. It was something in his eyes that drew her to him. And she became very fond of him. Now one strange, not one really, really hot summer day, they were near a town and they were right at the edge, right at the edge of a lake. It was the middle of the day, 12 o'clock noon. It was so hot. And Pranima's husband said, please, Pranima, I'm so thirsty. I know you are too. Would you go into town and get some oranges? That would just be a great way to satisfy our thirst. Look, you can just leave me in the basket right by the lake. I'll be fine. So she set him down by the lake at the edge of the lake in the basket, went off to town to get the oranges. He's kind of looking out over the lake. There's not even a ripple of water, hardly a breath of air. It's so hot, so hot, so hot. His eyelids start to droop. And all of a sudden, he noticed something in the sky. There was a big black crow circling around and around and around. And all of a sudden, the crow dove in the water and disappeared. That's odd, he thought. Then about 100 feet out, what emerged from that water was not a crow but a beautiful, beautiful swan. And that swan flapped its wings and flapped its wings and flew off into the distance. And Pranima's husband said, oh, oh, this is no ordinary lake. I've just seen a change of crow into a swan. Maybe it can make me into a normal young man. I've got to get in that water. So he grabbed the sides of the basket and began to rock back and forth and rock back and forth. And then he flipped over, rolled into the water, got totally soaking wet all except one pinky finger, which somehow didn't get wet. And as soon as he hit that water, strength and energy started to pour into his limbs and throughout his whole body, he felt himself growing muscle, growing stronger. And within a couple of minutes, he stood up. He was a normal looking young man. Now there he is looking out over the lake, wonderstruck by what's happened to him. And he hears a voice from behind him saying, excuse me, sir, excuse me. Have you seen my husband? I brought him some oranges. And he turned around and said, Pranima, it's me, it's me. You, she said, you don't look like him at all. What did you do? Rob him and throw him in the lake? Where's my husband? Pranima said, or Pranima's husband said, no, no, no. He said, this is a magic lake. It has healing waters. I saw a change of crow into a swan. Look, look, see this little finger? Somehow this little finger didn't get wet. Watch what happens when I put the finger in the water. And he put it in and it came out true and straight and strong, just so like the rest of, the rest of him. And, Oh, Pranima was so happy. She came and gave him a great, great big hug. Then he looked at her and he said, Pranima, my dear, this is my story. I'm not really that beggar you saw at your palace gate. I'm really a prince from a nearby kingdom. And this is what happened to me. I was out with my hunting party one day and we were chasing this deer. Not only did I get separated from the hunting party, but after I kept chasing the deer, I lost track of the deer and I found myself in a very, very strange part of my kingdom. I didn't know where I was. And I knew I had to ask directions to get back to the palace. And the only place I could see that might give me directions was rather this kind of strange, eerie looking little, little house. I went and knocked on the door. And who should be in that house but a witch? And that witch cast a spell on me and that witch, that spell decreed that I had to become a helpless, scrawny beggar at the gate of your palace until someone would come along and take care of me, not because of what I look like on the outside, but because of what I really am on the inside. And you are that special person, and you have stuck through me through all these difficult days and weeks and months. So now you should be rewarded. You shall return with me to my palace, and you shall become my queen. And they say that Pranima became not only a very kind and gracious queen, but a very wise and able ruler as well. And that is the story of the Magic Lake, which reminds me of a song. And this is one of the first songs I brought to India back in 1974. <clears throat> and uh, you may have heard the song. It's, people think it's a children's song, but it's not really. It was written by a grandmother back in the 1960s, and she wrote it for everybody. 
And it was a big hit in Merazan. In fact, it became, anytime I would show up, Meru would say, now Bill, you must sing the Magic Penny. Did you bring the Magic Penny? So we're gonna do the Magic Penny song. And I think it goes really nicely with the story we just told. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Now love is like a magic penny, Hold it too tight, you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, you have so many, they'll roll all over the floor. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Now money is handy, we like to use it. Love is better if you don't misuse it. It's a treasure. You'll never lose it if you don't lock up your door. Everybody sing. Love is something if you give it away. Give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away. You end up having more. Let's go dance until the break of day. If there's a piper, well, we can pay. Because love is something if you give it away. You end up having more. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Love Baba more and more. Jay Baba. So, just a couple of questions, and we'll tell some Baba stories, but. It, if you could tell me if anybody wants to, uh, if you want to raise a hand or whatever, I, I, I'm sure I'll get some help on that. Shilpa, you'll, you'll do the raised hands and all? I will. I'll help okay, you. Okay, any comments on the stories or maybe someone want to say something special you might want to think of doing on Earth Day or maybe your class is doing? So just... Uh... Bahana? I don't know what my class is going to be doing, but I hope it's good weather on Earth Day. So me and my mom might do some planting, maybe. Or I could draw a picture. Great. Good. Donna, do you want to share uh, what you learned about um, the environment the other day when we were watching that video? By the way, there's a great, uh, what was it called, Shoha? It's called Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground on Netflix. It has some oh. very inform great information about earth and carbon dioxide and plants. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Sia? <laughs> okay, anybody Anybody want to say uh, anything about any of the stories I just told? Did any of them hit home with you? Any reaction to the stories? Any, any thoughts you have on the story? Go ahead, Sia. Um, the second one, I kind of heard it before. Um, it was very interesting when, because I didn't hear it in this way. It was kind of different. Yeah, stories are like that. You know, stories, great stories get passed down from storytellers to storytellers and nothing is perfect. Erich used to say he never told the same story twice. But there's just tiny little differences you would make or maybe just, it's long. The important thing is to get the message in the story. Okay. Meher says, yeah. Yep, yeah, Meher. You had your hand raised? Uh, I think the story was uh, interesting. Which one? The the story you just told us. Oh, the fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah, the magic lake. I love that story. I just think it's a great story. You know, I the, I love to pick. One of the first rules of being a storyteller is, you should only pick stories that you love, because that love comes through. That feeling comes through. You know, if you feel you have to tell a story. You know, then it doesn't work. But if you pick, it's just like with songs. When you sing a song that you love, well, you love to sing it. When you tell a story you love, you love to tell it. Okay, well, that's great. Um, okay, see, yeah, we have some more there. 
Yeah, you want to Sorry, see? I forgot to put my hand down. That's okay. okay. Shireen or uh, Srinidhi, any comments? Or Ian? I've kind of heard the fairy tale before, but like, and yeah, and like, it wasn't exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So two, two, two stories are better than one, right? If even if they're a little bit different. Hey, what I want to do is tell a few Baba stories, do a few songs, um, and I want to start by te if you guys will all mute up, uh, teaching you a little bit of Baba chant. It's part of a song by Baba's great Indian songwriter, Mata Sudan who also used to write, he mo wrote most of his songs, I believe in Hindi or maybe Marathi, but um, he also wrote several wonderful English songs. And this is one, very easy to sing. What it is like in that first song I did where you repeat after me, the first line is, whoops, I gotta get my capo here, so I'm all set. Don't, oh, gotta do it up a little bit. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved Mayher. And then you repeat that after me if you want to. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved Mayher. And then the chorus is, Oh Mayher, Oh Mayher, Oh Mayher, beloved Mayher. Oh Mayher, Oh Mayher. So oh, that's good. I'm glad some of you know this song. I love this song. I'm not going to do the verses, though, because it's a little bit too long. But just this chorus is enough. In fact, you can walk around just singing this chorus all day if you like. Yo, may hair. All right. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved may hair. Everybody. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved Mayher. Oh Mayher, oh Mayher, oh Mayher, beloved Mayher. Oh Mayher, oh Mayher, oh Mayher, beloved Mayher. One more time. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved Mayher. Don't worry, be happy forever. Sing the name of beloved Mayher. Oh, Mayher, oh, Mayher, oh, Mayher, beloved Mayher. Oh, Mayher, oh, Mayher, oh, Mayher, beloved Mayher. I love that. Okay, I've got a story Eric used to tell. And uh, I don't know whether Baba taught him this story, told this story, or Erich's mother, Gaimai, um, used to tell him stories at bedtime when he was a boy. And I know he remembered some of those stories and would tell them at Mondeley Hall. So this story takes place a long, long, long time ago in, in India, of course, and it takes place near a river. And there was a village near the river, and not too far from the village, there lived a very holy man, a saintly man in a little hut he pretty much kept to himself because he just liked to pray and meditate on the Lord. And sometimes the Lord would appear to him and he had a little garden. He would grow his own food. But every once in a while, he would have to go into the village to sort of take care of some sort of business or maybe trade food for something. And well, this fellow was not the handsomest fellow in the world. He was very, very poor. He wore a very threadbare robe with patches in it. He didn't have any sandals. He had kind of a big forehead with bushy eyebrows and his hair kind of stuck out and had kind of a big hook nose. So when he would go into the village, people would make fun of him. They'd poke him, they'd push him around, they'd laugh at him. Sometimes they'd actually push him to the ground. The children would throw stones at him and chase him. The dogs would nip at his heels. But he took all this with great kindness and patience. He never struck back. He never tried to defend himself. Well, one day it so happened that he got word that his brother, who lived a few villages down the river, needed, he was not, not too well, and he needed this fellow to come and take care of him. So he, he went and boarded. There was a nice big boat that would ply and go between all the villages. So he got on the boat. There he is on the boat, and all these other villages from his village, villagers from his village are on the boat. 
And suddenly they noticed they had this poor fellow trapped. And they got him into a corner and they started to be merciless when they were poking him and kind of slapping him a little bit and making fun of him and laughing at him and everything. And as he'd been doing all along, he was just taking it all very peacefully, accepting it all. Well, the Lord got so upset that he spoke in the man's heart and he said, you who are my special friend, my very special friend, why don't you defend yourself? Why don't you fight back? Why don't you, don't let these people harass you like this. Take a stand and fight back. And uh, he spoke back to the Lord in his heart and he said, Lord, if I really am your special friend, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. Why don't you open their eyes, open their inner eyes so they can see the beautiful love that you have poured in my heart. And instantly, it was like a veil parted from their eyes and they saw that even he, even though he was kind of strange and unsightly looking on the outside, he had all this pure gold of love in his heart. And that pure gold seemed to come out to them and touch their hearts and they began to weep and they began to weep and they got on their knees and they asked this man for forgiveness. And of course he forgave them. He went on his way, got to spend a couple of weeks with his brother. And when he returned to his village, he discovered that they had, they had built a special seat for him in the village where he was welcome to come and sit with them anytime and teach them about love for the Lord. And so he became the village saint. And that's a story from Erich from a long, long time ago in India. Now, that reminded me of a song. I want to do some Baba songs. And, and uh, when I first came back from India, I realized that I could had the gift, Baba would give me the gift of maybe writing music to a poem or writing a song. And uh, so I've done a few over the years. And this is one uh, from the Australian poet named Francis Brabazon. He put out a little booklet with lyrics to songs. And he said, just put your own tune to them. So this is one called Someone. <clears throat> Listen now and I will tell you Of someone, someone, someone Someone Listen carefully and I will tell you Of someone And he is the best of all and he is the best of all. For him every day the sun rises, rises, rises. Rises. Every day the sun gladly rises. And to him the birds sing and call. And to him the birds sing and call. He comes only every so often, 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 often. He comes only every so often, and he comes for both big and small, and he comes for both big and small. Oh, he is so very loving. Loving, 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 so extraordinarily loving that he bears the burden of all, that he bears the burden of all. For him oft I lie awake listening, listening, listening. Listening, many nights I lie awake listening in my heart for his footfall, in my heart for his footfall. His name is Meher Baba, 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 Baba. God, man, and the friend of us all. God, man, and the friend of us all. God, man, and the friend 
Well, here's a couple of Baba stories for you. I think you'll like these. Um, back in the 1950s, Baba was in, I believe he was in Panchgani, which is about three hours from Pune and about six hours from Meribad. And over the years, Baba was always in search of what he called the ideal boy or the perfect boy. It was for a special work that he was doing with all the young peoples of the world, a work that would go on after Baba had dropped the body. So they're in Panchgani and Baba asked Vishnu to go into the market and see in Panchkani, could he find a, a, an ideal boy, a perfect boy. So Vishnu goes around and finally he finds a young fellow, maybe 13 or 14, who he feels would just fit Baba's instructions perfectly. And he brings him back to Baba and Baba's sort of looking him over and sort of kind of nodding his head. And all of a sudden, Baba noticed a big bruise near the boy's ankle. And he looks at Vishnu and gets very angry and gestures, Vishnu, I told you to bring an ideal boy, a perfect boy, and you bring me a boy with a big bruise on his ankle? This will never do, never do. I want you to take him to Meribad, the Padri, so Padri can help him and cure him of this bruise and heal this bruise up. And Vishnu, who is very obedient, said, yes, Baba. So he and the boy set out to the bus station, but Vishnu is thinking to himself, why would Baba want to send me six hours to Meribad the Padre when this boy only has a bruise by his ankle? I mean, there's any doctor in, in Panchgani will, will be more than able to take care of him. He couldn't figure this out. So he boards the bus to Pune. And they had to change buses in Pune. It's about three hours. And they get out of the bus and they're walking from one bus station to the, to the bus that will take them to Abhinagar. It's another bus station. And they... They go by a small group of women in the marketplace who are sort of chatting and all of a sudden this one woman shrieks and she says, Ali, Ali, my lost son, Ali, Ali. And he says, mother, mother, mother. And she goes and she hugs him and he hugs her and they're both crying. And Vishnu suddenly realizes that Baba had absolutely no intention of sending this boy to Meribah, to Padri. He just used that as an excuse because in Baba's omniscience, he knew that this boy was somehow, whether he'd been kidnapped or whether he'd just run away or something, but he knew that this boy was longing to be with his mother, that he couldn't afford that bus fare to get back and that she was longing to be with him. So Baba, and Vish, with Vishnu's help, had the mother and son reunited. So that's one of my favorite stories. It reminds me of another story. Have you, any of you heard that story before? Uh, no, uh, what, what year was this, Bill, do you know? I'm thinking in, the, in, in 55 or 56, I'm not sure. It's, it's in several locations, but I just don't, okay. I, I can't give you a reference on that. Um, I think Sia also has another question. Yes. Sia. Um, no, um, actually my grandma told me the same story. Good. That's good that your grandma knows good stories like that. Okay, we're going to go back. And I've got a book here. I'm going to sort of read a little bit and, and uh, sort of kind of tell a little bit. This is a book called Mayor Baba, The Compassionate Father, put together by one of Baba's early Baba lovers, uh, Indian Baba lovers, Dr. Barucha. And this goes back to the 1930s. And again, Baba is looking for the ideal young boy. And so what happened was they were in Rishikesh in the Himalayas with Baba. And one day Erich was hurrying through the woods known as the abode of sages, where yogis and rishis live and meditate on God in small white huts. And what did he notice? But in a very small dilapidated hut with no roof, there was a young boy of about 13 or 14 years old. And he was surprised to see that someone so young so when Baba came back, he'd been out somewhere maybe looking for musk. And when he came back to Rishikesh, Erich told Baba about this young fellow and said, Baba, you need to come and meet him. He may be the perfect boy you're looking for. So Baba agreed. And when they arrived at the hut, Baba sort of was off in the distance where the boy couldn't see him. So Erich went in and he asked the boy, well, what was he doing there? And he said, well, my parents are in Ambala. I don't imagine Ambala is very close to the, to the Himalayas. 
But this boy at a young age had had this great urge to go to the Himalayas to search for God and find God. So he'd left. He just left his family and set out on his own. And uh, Eric said, well, do you have a guru? And the boy said, no, no, I don't have any guru. The, all these gurus talk too much. I want a guru who doesn't talk at all. And Eric lights up and he says, well, I just happen to know someone who hasn't speak, spoken for 18 years. His name is Mayor Baba. And the boy at once had heard of Baba. He knew that Baba was in Rishikesh. He said, but he said, I have heard of Mayor Baba, but who am I? I mean, Baba is too great a man to want to have anything to do with a young boy like me. Well, that was Baba's cue to step in the door. And Eric introduced the boy to Baba and Baba to the boy. And the little boy, the young fellow, was just overjoyed that here was Baba, the one that he would love to see. And Baba gestured to him, I myself will become your guru. And this is the only time you're ever going to see me. You will never see me again. And if I'm to become your guru, you have to follow these orders that I'm going to give to you. And these are the orders that he gave to the boy. One, he should be free from lust and should never touch a woman during his whole life. Two, he should always, thinking of real, always think of realizing God and finding God within him. Three, he must never touch money and for the rest of his life he must beg for food. And four, as a mantra, a guru mantra, <clears throat> he must keep repeating God's name, a name of his, his choice. So the little boy chose Om Hari Naravan, and that was his choice. So without the slightest hesitation, this wonderful little boy agreed to obey these difficult orders given by Baba. Baba then left, and there he was in that dilapidated hut, unmindful of the snakes and the scorpions that abounded in that place. He showed no fear at all because he wanted to realize God and see the beloved within his own heart. Well, what happened was the next day, Baba sent him some prasad, a package of prasad, which included a Baba button with Baba's photo on it, a little booklet with the story of Baba's life, a mat to sit on, and some flour so the boy could make some chapatis for himself to eat. And when the man, the Mandali person, it might have been Eric, arrived with this wonderful prasad, he didn't hear the boy repeating Om Hari Naravan. He heard the little boy repeating Baba's name, Meher Baba, Meher Baba. And the boy was overjoyed to receive the prasad. Then Baba left Rishikesh, and as the blue bus was starting to move out, they noticed the little boy was walking along the road with the mat under his arm and the little pot of flour on his head. And so Eric asked him, where are you going? And the little boy said, well, my guru has left Rishikesh. There's no reason for me to stay here any longer. And the blue bus moved away and the Mandali kept looking at the boy till he slowly faded on the horizon for they knew they would never see him again. Isn't that a wonderful story? Beautiful. You could, I, and that, that would be, if you were going to make a movie about Baba's life, that would be a wonderful one. If you could just imagine that as a scene in the movie. Um, somebody has something, Shalaja has something to say there. Yeah? Jeff, I was telling that it was beautiful, the story and music. Uh -huh. Have you heard that story before? No. Oh, good. Well, here's a song I think that the song that I wrote that was inspired by Mara. And somehow that story reminded me of this song. It's kind of short. It's called Sweet May Hair You Come For All. I'm thinking of those two boys. Sweet May Hair You Come For All. For all you come, you come for all. Sweet May Hair You Come For All. For all you come for. Friend, may hair your hand for all, for all your hand, your hand for all. Friend, may hair your hand for all, for all your hand for all. Dear, may hair your pain for all, for all your pain, your pain for all. Dear, may hair your pain. For all, for all your pain for all. 
Lord may hear your love for all, for all your love, your love for all. Lord may hear your love for all, for all your love for all. Sweet may hear you come for all. That's a true song. All songs are true, but that's especially true. So I think we have till 515, Angela. I think I have permission to go to 515 here. I want to do one more story. And uh, again, it's from this book, uh, The Compassionate Father. This is one of my favorite. I've, I've read this story many times at our Baba meetings here in Albany. It's called Baba the Slave of His Lover's Love. Now, Baba was, in 1954, he went on his mass darshan tours to Iluru. And um, he was scheduled to give darshan there, I believe, on February 24th. But on the 22nd, he arrived late in the evening. And the next morning, so everybody in Iluru could find out that Baba was giving darshan, a flyer was printed up and it was distributed to all the people in the town. Now, that afternoon, on his way home from school, a little four-year-old boy picked up the flyer. And right away, he just fell in love with Baba, looking at Baba's picture. And he ran home and told his mother and father, please, please, Baba's giving darshan the day after tomorrow. Please, or tomorrow, please, please, please. Can I go? Can I go for Baba's darshan? Please take me. Well, they were a high caste Brahmin family. And they, they had heard that Baba was a, quote, Parsi saint. And they said, absolutely not. We're not going to take you to a Parsi saint. And the boy started crying and crying. And, Finally, his father said, you're not even going to have dinner tonight. He spanked him and sent him to bed. So there's a little boy with Baba's picture tucked under his pillow, crying himself to sleep. And the next morning, he had to go to school. And he felt so sad because he wasn't going to meet Baba. And he went to his school. Now, it so happened that that particular day, Baba was going to be driving around the city, going to his lover's homes, going to places like the Rotary Club or a factory that is one of his lovers might own, and to schools. So the bus is driving by this boy's school. Now, this school was not on the schedule. But inside Baba, it suddenly became on his schedule. Baba ordered the bus to be stopped. He got out of the bus, walked into the school, never having been there before, walked right into the little boy's classroom. And as soon as the little boy saw him, he just flew into Baba's arms, crying in happiness and joy. And Baba just, they just hugged for a while. And then Baba left. And the next day before Baba was to leave Uluru, the little boy had told his parents that evening what had happened in school. And that late that evening, they felt very bad about what, what the father had sent him to bed and spanked him and all. They went to where Baba was staying and begged Baba's forgiveness. And of course, Baba forgave them. So that's another one of my favorite stories. Uh, and somehow this song goes with the story, kind of. It's called Baba, Baba, Come and Stay in My House. The last song I'll do today. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. Baba, Baba, come and stay with me. <clears throat> Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. I know someday you're gonna set me free. Beloved Baba is our eternal love. He's in everything and everywhere. The soul of souls, he's the one who cares. He's all over the ground and in the air. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. Baba, Baba, come and stay with me. 
Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. I know someday you're gonna set me free. Baba wants from you love and honesty. Surrender and obey him if you can. Know his will is yours. Know his will is all. Drown in his ocean of love. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. Baba, Baba, come and stay with me. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. I know someday you're gonna set me free. Have faith in Mayor Baba. He will show the way. Become a slave, he will set you free. He loves like the sun that shines on everyone. Become like the dust beneath his feet. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. Baba, Baba, come and stay with me. Baba, Baba, come and stay in my house. I know someday you're gonna set me free. <clears throat> well, we have a few minutes left here, and uh, I just want to ask the children if any of you would like to share any special way that Baba has helped you in your life. Would any of you like to share, like, a little Baba story of how Baba came? Maybe can, in, 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 in a special coincidence or anything where Baba has helped you or is helping you in your life. I see we have one hand up anyway. Yeah. Um, I think it was a few weeks ago or one month ago maybe. Um, I had a test that I really didn't know anything about it. It was in math and I'm really bad at math. And Baba helped me to learn, like, the whole subject, and he made me pass the test. Good, good, good. Anybody else have something they want to share? Sahana, go ahead. Um, similar, a little bit similar to what um, Sia said. So, um, I don't know. So, I learned a, I learned a little bit of, like, so I learned the subject, but I moved a class. So they are basically that class is a little bit behind my old class. So I didn't really remember stuff because you learned this a month ago and then, but they're still learning. My, my new class is still learning it now. And it's the same as that grade, but, um, so I'm like, oh, I forgot this. Oh, God, and we learned it. So because I missed sort of, I came in the middle of, I don't know how to say this, but um, so there was this, um, a math test. And, um, and then I'm like, oh, my God, I don't remember this at all. So I'm like, okay, Baba, please, please help me. And then, like, I'm like, okay, so just went through the questions, and I got the test right. Like, I got almost all the answers right. And I think I got like, um, like maybe like two wrong, but yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's so important. We can we can call on Baba to help us in any situation in our life. Leave it as in his hands. Um, anybody else? Any other children have something they want to say? Um, Mayor has his hand up. Yeah. So uh, I had a science. Uh, I before I had a science test, and I and I I thought it would be like a pretty long test with some hard questions, but I got. Uh, uh, through them pretty easily with Baba. Good. See, Baba just doesn't go into school 50 years ago and hug a little boy. He comes into your schoolwork and helps you out. That's great. 
-hmm. You got to do your part. Of, yeah. You got to do your part, though, and work hard, and then Baba helps. Yeah. Srinidhi, Ayan, Shireen, anybody else wants to share any experience? Go ahead, Srinidhi. So um, it was like uh, it was like uh, in second in middle of their first and second quarter, um, I just switched to in person learning, and uh, the e learners were behind, and the in person learners had this like big test, a chapter test in science class. So um, I like e learners only knew like three quarters of it, and I barely knew anything about the last section of the test. So um, uh, like I, there were like 48 problems. I think I got like a 42 out of 48. And like, it was just all about chance. Cause like, I just guessed mm -hmm. quarter of the question, quarter of the test. Good, good. I remember Pendu, Bob was mindfully saying, he said, Bob is always willing to help, but you have to, we have to try 100%. That's when the best help comes, and when we try 100%. And he lifts us over that 100% that hump into the 1% that he, whatever he can give us. Well, it looks like we're just about done here. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you children very much, and I think uh, we have a different, another Zoom meeting coming on right now. So I'm just going to say, Jay Baba, to all the children. And Jay Baba the, Bill, thank you oh, so much. Jay Baba Bill. Yeah, Jay, Jay Shilpa, Baba. Uh, Shilpa, Ian asked for chords to a couple of those songs. If you can yeah. email him his address, yep. I will mail them. I will mail them to him. I'll, I'll send the song sheet in the in the in the, uh, the chords. Okay. Uh, yes. Yep. Thank yes, you. Ian, yes, right. thank you. Jay Baba. Thank you. Jay Baba. Thank, you Jay Baba. Jay Baba. thank you so Jay much. The songs are good. The songs are good. Yeah, we yeah. enjoyed everything. So yes, very good. Very good. Very good. Everything is very good. Bye, nice. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Bye. Jay Baba. 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 J